So this talk derives from a chapter um, in a book that I'm currently writing titled Hong Kong's Built Heritage. I feel really embarrassed as I have to look to finish the book, but um, which examines the typologies uh, and evolving meanings ascribed to a range of built forms in the city over the last three decades. The chapter in question focuses on the interpretations of Hong Kong's modern architecture, which has attracted increasing attentions from civil society. Now, many commentators have already pointed out that the phenomenon of this interest in heritage is a consequence of decolonization, which has led to a growing desires among local citizens to secure a unique place identity, threatened by accelerating integration with mainland China on the one hand and relentless urban redevelopment on the other. The situation has begun to challenge the longstanding official approach to built heritage protection, which tended to focus on historical buildings with exceptional architectural merits. So more attention now is now placed on um, modern architecture, including util utilitarian buildings constructed in the post-war era, which are seen to be embedded with collective memories of the people and thereby symbolize Hong Kong's rise from a humble immigrant society to a thriving international metropolis in the last, past half century. The audience here must be familiar with these well-known examples of modern architecture whose proposed redevelopment had sparked intense public debates, including the now demolished Star Perry Pier, as well as the central government office and central market, which have undergone high profile conservation and have been widely featured as successful cases in the international media. These are two posters of events organized to promote the conservation of modern architecture back about 10 years ago now, in 2014, by Dokumumo Hong Kong, an organization dedicated to promote the conservation of the modern movement, of which I'm also one of the members. Um, from my observation, there's no question that in the embrace of Hong Kong's modern architecture as heritage is now a social movement, which has captured uh, the public imagination. I'd like to pivot now, however, to consider the changing meanings of the modern and how particular built forms have been interpreted or revitalized at different moments in time. So shown here is a 1960s advert for a real estate development, um, contrasting a proposed new modern high-rise development against an existing three-story Pong Lao building next to it. Obviously, the purpose at the time was to emphasize the newness and desirability of the modern tower to the then outdated walk-up structure. These images, which were published in a brochure uh, of the Hong Kong Real Estate Association, were accompanied by rather poetic descriptions of the rising city, accentuating Hong Kong's triumphant um, economic progress and the role of modern architecture and building construction within it. Now fast forward to the present, um, as we all know that the Tong Lao or tenement buildings has now been a much cherished building type by architectural conservationists and also the public as well. And this is an ongoing uh, exhibition in Taekwun on the top. An easy rep uh, explanation of the phenomenon is, is their fast disappearing and rarities, right? All these buildings. But the kinds of values and significance we ascribe to these buildings along with the other so-called ordinary built forms, are a lot more complex than we assumed, I would argue. And this is what I'd like to discuss in the remainder of this talk, that we assume a more complex set of relationships with, Hong, with the Hong Kong built environment, even though the discovery of the love or hate, sorry, the love of old buildings, right? Not hate. Uh, <laughs> and the love of modern architecture, ones we hate, actually. <laughs> It's a shared phenomenon across many cities around the world, a closer examination of the narratives about Hong Kong's built environment and heritage also reveals specific discourses and historical trajectories that is unique to Hong Kong. Now, my interest in this new attentions to the disappearing buildings first came from my observation about the search of features in the media in the early 2000s a time that coincided with the high-profile campaigns to conserve not only iconic structures such as the Star Ferry Pier, but also public housing estates and other anonymous older apartment blocks and tenement buildings, now labeled as Hong Kong's modern vernacular heritage. These subjects have become popular discussion subjects online. At the same time, the circulation of these images 
have also encouraged locals and visitors alike to go around the city and rediscover its architecture and uh, urban heritage. Now, although the idea of Hong Kong modern vernacular, which is now represented by these kind of images, is a new term, it was actually first invoked in the 1980s and 90s before the public became so interested in heritage. The people who were interested in this building at the time were overseas architects. They were attracted to the city's many anonymous tower blocks whose original characters had been transformed over time by the erection of many illegal and semi-legal additions. An example can be seen in a 1992 special issue in the Japanese architectural magazine Space Design. The collection was titled Hong Kong Alternative Metropolis, or Tsiu Kap Dosi, which represented Hong Kong as an alternative model to that of the modernist city in the West. Here, the mixed-use building functions and lax building regulations were said to have allowed Hong Kong to retain a vibrant urban life and society. Articles in the collections further argued that the presumed role of the architect as a master planner was no longer relevant, and it is time, they said, quote, to see inspiration from dynamic Asian cities like Hong Kong, which offers many sources to conceive alternative design and planning strategies that can reconstruct the lost relationship between architecture and the city, end quote. This search for vernacular solutions to urban problems from Hong Kong reached a peak in 1993 with the demolition of the Kowloon Walled City, which, as many of you know, uh, of course, was a self-governance Chinese enclave that existed within Hong Kong's territory but lay outside British colonial jurisdiction. And despite its squalor and lawlessness, the walled city's anarchical character and flourishing economic activities made it an object of fascination for many foreign architects and visitors. These images were captured in a book, The City of Darkness, which has been published many times now by Ian Lambot uh, and Greg Gerard, who suggest that the builders and residents of the wall city succeeded in creating what modern architects had failed to do. That is, quote, an organic megastructure responsive to the changing requirements of its users whilst providing the warmth and intimacy of a single enormous household, end quote. Now the growing interest in the informal, the mundane, and the vernacular was rooted in a widespread disillusionment with architectural modernism, which had by the 1970s became linked in the West, right, to the failure of many modernist housing projects to improve the lives of inhabitants, mostly in Europe and America. But the call to learn from the Hong Kong model was also somewhat ironic, because although it was hailed by foreign architects as a unique solution to hyperdensity, many occupants of these tower blocks, which were themselves built according to the modern doctrine, they were not so enthusiastic with the buildings, like many members of the poorer working population. The aspirations of these residents have always been about moving to more modern, spacious, and secluded living environments. These contrasting interpretations suggest that there is a certain tendency to romanticize the informal city in the search for alternative urbanisms, and thereby ignore the politics and economics that drive and maintain Hong Kong's hyperdensity. The emphasis on diversity and heterogeneity from these images also has the effect of reinforcing the status quo, that is, you don't need more radical transformations of the vernacular to improve Hong Kong's worsening housing conditions. Like the architect's search for alternative urbanisms in the 1980s and 90s, the nostalgia attached to old tenements and celebration of the modern vernacular now also carries the risk of aestheticizing the built environment, making us forget the actual historical forces that shaped the urban conditions. And of course, in relation to this is also the risk of commodification of heritage and histories, which is now actually a well-researched topic in the field of heritage studies. But on a more hopeful note, our fascination with the vernacular and the growing activism on heritage has begun to prompt more critical reflections about the past in recent years. And these have in, um, in turn begin to usher new challenges to the conventional rationale for planning and development. So since the 2000s, 
There has been increased numbers of public forums, walking tours, and workshops organized by NGOs and community groups seeking to promote and provoke new understandings of heritage and histories. And shown here are two events organized by Dokomo Mo Hong Kong quite a few years ago now about the values of several public buildings slated for redevelopment, including um, now the now famous State Theater, uh, which was fortunately saved after a rigorous campaign led by local activists and also the, uh, the post office, which is not so fortunate, which is still slated for demolition. This is a brochure for a tour uh, that we organized uh, you know, back around COVID called Architecture We Love to Hate, which explores a range of controversial modernist buildings, mostly built between the 18, sorry, 19, <laughs> 1960s and 80s. And participants of the tour were asked to reflect on their own shifting perceptions of these structures, such as why are these buildings being deemed ugly and worthless? by some people, but treasured by others? What are the basis for forming these different opinions? How do judgment made by professionals and the general public affect the perceived values of the built landscapes and their fate in the ongoing redevelopment? And among these, of course, is the central post office again. Um, this is an article actually written by Carmen for HKI Journal in which um, uh, I think she discussed about this sort of changing values ascribed, right? The ugliness, the important, and in a way, it's it's really uh, trying to reflect on how do we re perceive these buildings now, which were built about 50 years ago, and uh, uh, the other images are also showing various engagement to uh, discuss this building, which was part of the brutalist categories of buildings in Hong Kong. There are also other forms of visual practices that seek to interrogate the city, capturing different facets of urban spaces and shown here. On the right, for example, is a poster showing some of the works by photographers on a Wafu estate, which is a soon to be demolished public housing um, complex, where the artists deploy different techniques to record stories of everyday life of residents. These images were presented in the public forums a couple of years ago raising a range of questions about heritage and history of Hong Kong, including asking, when does documentation compel us to conserve particular built forms, and when does it facilitate their erasure? How will these images transform our ways of looking and remembering and constructing our sense of historicity? So to be sure, the emergent movements on modern heritage in Hong Kong have surely helped to open up new ways of comprehending the city and rethinking the rationales of our development. Most importantly, they have invited audience to reflect on our own love-hate relationship with modern architecture that is shaped by ongoing economic and political change. And it is certainly an ongoing exercise of reinterpreting Hong Kong's heritage. So it is with this, I think I will end my presentation that hopefully we can still have about 20 minutes for this question. Thank you. Thank you.